A very warm welcome to you, Ariel Saleh, to here, to Berlin, to the RLS, and as well to you, all of you who came to join. My name is Katharina Pühl. I'm working here at the Institute for Social Analysis and Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in the field of feminist critique of society and capitalism, and also in the intersection of socio-ecological socio transformation. These are questions we will uh, have today uh, in discussion. Uh, to present Ariel, she once presented herself as Irish Jewish working class white woman in Australia. I got that from the book she wrote, um, the book Ecofeminism as Politics. Um, that's a re-edition which will be uh, out this summer, later than you wished it would be out. That, that's why I put the book cover, the maybe book cover, it might change. <laughs> Um, uh, there, so that we don't have really kind of a book launch as we thought, but a talk on behalf of the book and around topics of the book, and the second edition 20 years after its first um, edition. Ariel has been part of many ecofeminist debates since, uh, since the 1970s. She's traveling the world, so to say. Uh, cross-cutting academic, activists, and civil societies discussions around ecology, feminist debates, um, and a lot of topics more which we, she will uh, present to us uh, later. And she's kind of an organic intellectual, so to say, uh, going back and forth between social movements, experiences herself, being part of it, being part of founding social movements, actually and always coming back to critique and trying to sharpen it and to kind of talk from the point of today. That, would, that will be the plot. Um, she's a founding member um, of the Global University for Sustainability in Hong Kong, which is a unique institution. I don't know if you might mention it later. She is and was a visiting professor in culture, philosophy and environment at Nelson Mandela University. <coughs> and still is research associate in politi political economy in the University of Sydney, Australia, where she's based. She taught for many years social ecology um, and has lectured throughout several other places uh, about these topics all over the world. And now today she will reflect her work, the book, but also the work you did um, on top of that, uh, that book. And um, yeah. I want to say a few words about Ariel uh, additionally. Um, she will present her approach of a socialist ecofeminism, kind of, and how it is intertwined or uh, where are conjunctions to other uh, major uh, recent uh, critical debates. And she will speak 40 minutes, but we will go back and forth um, putting questions and uh, having her answers. Thereafter, we open for you and uh, discussion. And as you can see, we have to speak to the mic because we have translators, interpreters. Max Henninger and Stefan Schade are sitting over there and they can't hear your questions if you don't talk to a mic. So please make sure later we will pass it around that you talk to a mic. Also, I should mention that this uh, discussion is um, um, videoed, taped, however. And if you will only see the podium uh, later in the video, which will be presented at our website. But if you have a question and don't want to be heard on the taped video, just give us a sign. You can also write down the question on a card in German or English. And then I will get the card and put the question and share it with all of you. Um, yeah, that's for practical questions. And we see how it goes. Please speak like this to the mic, that's also advice from <coughs> our colleagues, so that um, the taping quality will be um, okay. Ariel, it's your turn. Katarina, thank you, thank you. Um, I want to say, I, I see a lot of uh, potential theorists in the room, but remember, no, no theory without praxis and I have to say, I have to confess that 
how I got myself into the, this mess of being an ecological feminist was very much through lived experience and movement struggles. And it started very young. I actually, the work that I do is focused on looking for a common denominator before what I see as the key, four key movements, workers, women's, indigenous and ecological struggles. And I guess I was always fairly defiant and critical of my own culture and made an interracial marriage as a student, which is a long time ago, in the 60s actually. In fact, a lot of feminists of my generation chose to make interracial marriages at that time, um, the good, good old 60s. And uh, this was the beginning of my thinking about decolonization. <laughs> I suppose it was a sort of personal praxis in decolonization. But uh, the outcome was I found myself being a student mother and with very little money. And this now began my interest in femi feminist politics. And I can remember the actual moment when I became a feminist. I had been doing some part-time tutoring and I had two little girls. We were living in one room and I paid my first income tax that year on the part-time earnings that I had. And a friend said to me, in Australia we have a method where you can claim certain expenses to do with your earnings back from the government after you've paid your tax. I got the letter back from the income, t I, I claimed for the childcare for my younger daughter. Um, I could not have prepared the lectures I was giving and the rest of it without that. And uh, the letter came back from the Australian government, uh, refund, disallowed, unnecessary personal expenditure. And I saw red. <laughs> and I went on TV and I had my students giving out flyers at bus stops about the hypocrisy of Mother's Day and the rest. So that was where the feminism began. Then the first job, the first real job I had was actually working with Aboriginal people. and. Uh, I was responsible for tracking their movements uh, ac across from the desert areas into the cities and finding out what their needs were in terms of education, uh, medical, housing and so forth. Um, this led into my first environmental struggle which was against the, the um, uranium mining which is impacting on indigenous lands in Australia. This is now in the 70s. And um, uh, we, myself and another woman, in fact women, start, this was really the birth of ecological feminist politics, both in Australia and the anti-nuclear struggles in Europe at that time were, were key mobilising um, moments. And uh, we formed a movement against uranium mining and within, I think, six months had 100,000 people marching the streets of Sydney to get a moratorium on the transnational corporations who were mining on Aboriginal lands. The Labor Party in Australia came to our aid, put the morator got the moratorium through, and within five years, a new government had dispensed with it, and we were back to square one, and this is still an ongoing struggle in Australia. One of my, another related interests was science for people, um, which still goes on, uh, critical science studies, I suppose you call it. And also, at the time, I had, was teaching sociology in a big industrial city. A lot of my friends were Communist Party members, some of them trade unions. In fact, I think this was a sharpening of the problems of how does feminism and socialism, Marxism, uh, find a modus vivendi. It was very personal, around the kitchen table, with a glass of wine and the debates. Uh, it was so interesting because uh, union friends of mine did not seem to be able to make generalise from the condition of the exploitation of workers to the domestic exploitation of the women in their own households. There was no capacity to move across. Um, it was clear now that there were a number of movements going on and this was a time when it seemed logical to form a Green Party and we did. And the first Green Party actually occurred in Australia 
1972, although I was involved in a second version of this in 1985. <clears throat> and then there were troubles with mines and water flooding communities that I were living in and so on. And eventually all of this came together at Rio Earth Summit in 1992 where the penny dropped for me that this whole thing was part of one huge capitalist uh, patriarchal mess. And that's really the moment when the book was conceived. The book that we haven't got here, but I hope we will eventually see. And um, the, the book works through green politics, Marxism, feminism, and so forth, looking for a common denominator of all the struggles. And I find the struggles, I shouldn't really tell you the punchline so early, but I will, I'll let the secret out. The struggle is in women's reproductive labors, uh, reproductive in the broadest sense of cultural, economic, social, and biological reproduction. Um, of course, mu much of this labor can just as well be done by men, um, but for historically it's fallen to women uh, to maintain the productive mode of production, if you like, a mode of reproduction as distinct from um, productivist relations. So right from the start, ecofeminism has been, well, I should talk a little bit perhaps about the movement at large, um, but you, you will see that it is, uh, while, while the, I was just one particular woman going through these political experiences, women all over the world were um, forming similar conclusions. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, about the emergence of ecofeminism generally. Sorry, have, I, have people been not hearing me because I'm not holding the mic? No? It's okay? Um, as I said, it starts in the 60s and it starts particularly the nuclear industry and, and you had at that stage American housewives taking major nuclear corporations to court um, over essentially what we would call ecological crimes now. Uh, and we had in, the, in uh, India uh, forest-dwelling women protesting, throwing their bodies around the trees. You've probably heard of the Chipko tree huggers to stop them being stop deforestation and so forth. We had um, uh, in France, Francois de Bonne, um, probably the first woman ever to use the word ecofeminism. Uh, she, her conclusion was, and it was the title of her book, Ecofeminism uh, or Death. That <laughs> was pretty strong. Um, at the time, there were Women and Life on Earth, uh, was, was another important uh, development going on with women um, blockading Greenham Common, where the, which was a, to be a, a, a missile base. And uh, in, in the United States, another group of women and life on Earth were um, encircling the Pentagon. And in Germany, you had a bunch of women, largely around Bielefeld, who were starting to theorize relations between feminism and Marxism, and with particular interest in Luxembourg's work and the colonial links, and in fact, Maria Mies, still alive, a very, very important eco-feminist thinker who explored the intrinsic tie-up between the exploitation of women in the domestic sphere, colonial exploitation, and uh, the cap exploitation of the wage worker. We, we'll come back to that. So why was all this happening? If there, there was, why was it women? There was a certain untheorized sense but among women that somehow uh, the care for family and relations was related to care for the living environment and the resources we need for living. But it, it, wasn't, 
it wasn't sophisticated, it wasn't theoretical, it wasn't using Marxism on, on the whole, apart from Mises' magnificent contribution. Um, you could sort of say that the first premise of ecofeminism was that uh, women's observing that they were, in the present Eurocentric dominant culture, women themselves were being treated as, as nature, as closer to nature, often as natural resources. And this, of course, stems from ancient Greece and the Aristotelian great hierarchy, the chain of being with God at the top, um, wealthier priests, probably wealthier men, all the way through to women, women slaves, children, uh, animals, plants, and, and so on. And this was embedded in Western civilization and is still, these, this kind of imaginary is, is tacit behind how our economics is designed, how our law, um, and of course in religion it's very clear um, so it, wor it worked sort of by a dualism, which you've, you've probably encountered this interest in dualisms in ecofeminism, that Aristotle is assuming that the sphere of men is a sphere of civilization and culture, the sphere of women, women are in the sphere of nature, so you have humanity over nature, you have white over black, you have men over women, this kind of dualistic code, land over water, you know, um, rights over responsibilities and so on. Uh, and ecofeminist women were challenging this. Often they were, it was misconstrued, their challenge, they were accused of actually saying that they were closer to nature. And there's a kind of paradox in that. Um, of course, we are all close to nature. Of course, we are actually humans, our nature in embodied form. But in these early stages, there was a lot of confusion about the concept of nature and women's relation to nature. And with feminism starting to emerge, particularly liberal feminists and socialist feminists were very dodgy about in any way at all associating women with nature. Because as you know, women's bodies uh, are resourced and exploited. Uh, and the naturalization of women's subjection is uh, uh, part of that, the whole process which feminism has to struggle against. So there's a, a kind of a paradox and a dialectical process going on there. So while women were finding their way um, through, through this uh, in engagement in struggles over toxics or nukes or forests or whatever, um, they, other women were bringing various academic lenses. So Marxism was starting to brought, brought to ecofeminism discourse analysis, psychoanalysis, and so forth. And so that, that has given ecofeminist theory, which is now a huge body of literature. You could, you could teach a university uh, major, you know, three years and an honours level um, using the material that we have. Um, it has many inflections within it. But the basic... Uh, sort of nitty-gritty of ecofeminism is to do with women's struggles for the conditions of everyday life. And at the moment, there's an incredible revival of interest in ecofeminism around the world. And I suspect that the threat that climate change is making to the future of human survival has got a large, you know, a lot to do with that. So I just pick out half a dozen or so theorists who you may or may not have heard of who I, who I consider to be exemplars of ecofeminism. 
Um, and the first one is a real classic, 1980, the book was called The Death of Nature, Carolyn Merchant. She was a historian of science at Berkeley University. And in this book, she looks at the meaning of the scientific revolution, the 17th century scientific revolution in the UK, in Britain, which only occurred by dint of eliminating the knowledge of women, women midwives, women healers. Uh, this is one of the studies of the witch burnings, which a number of feminists in the 80s were looking at. Um, I mean, I could mention Ehrenreich, I could mention Merchant, um, Mies looks at it. Um, I think Federici is going to be speaking here soon. She's also running with, with this um, aspect of the analysis of women's oppression. Uh, the point about the scientific revolution was that earlier concepts of nature had seen nature as organic and living, whereas once the scientific revolution was brought in, nature was reconceptualized as a machine and the machine could be uh, controlled and managed, often by mathematical formulae and so forth. Um, the, the inquisition of the women, supported by King James, no less, um, uh, allowed the royalist uh, society to be established for men and the profession of science and profession of medicine to be uh, to be uh, properly legit legitimated at women's expense. Francis Bacon, uh, who you no doubt met in your studies, um, his rhetorical call is very telling of the gendered nation, nature of the scientific revolution. He says, for you have but to follow and as it were hound nature in her wanderings. Neither ought a man to make scruple of entering and penetrating into these holes and corners when the inquisition of truth is the whole object. Maria Mies, uh, book uh, Patriarchy and Accumulation on a World Scale, followed about five years later. Mies, as I've mentioned, used Marxism, also the psychological theory of object relations. And she was particularly focused on uh, how violence on the reproductive body is intrinsic to the functioning of the capitalist system. I cannot recommend the book to you highly enough to find it. I think it's been republished again recently. Mies uh, was very interested in uh, the impact of German colonization in, we in West Africa found that it had a double impact on women's lives. African women who ran farms and who ran markets and who, who had economic independence lost their independence with the white man's economy coming in. And they were, in a sense, housewified, which is Mee's term, pushed back, made secondary to their partners when they had them. And the same happened in Germany. Bourge women, bourgeois, middle-class women who had certain uh, provisioning schools were housified and turned into mere consumers of cheap imported goods from the colonies. So there's this north-south uh, process going on in capitalism. Meanwhile, of course, German men, the, pro the German proletarian male, had his own little colony with the housewifeized partner at his disposal. So you're beginning to see that ecofeminists uh, involve a critique of science and a critique of development. And of course, Vandana Shiva's work, this is coming in, of course, with Mies, but in Vandana Shiva's work, Staying Alive, 1989, not long after, um, she describes the impact of uh, what she calls maldevelopment or colonization, and the fact that with the import of green revolution technologies, petro farming, she calls it, pesticides, fertilizers, um, hybrid seeds, which of course the peasants can't really afford, um, lay waste to centuries long techniques of livelihood and provisioning. And um, she 
actually to quote her, she says, don't forget the Dust Bowl technology for the manufacture of deserts from fertile soils was first mastered by colonization of native Indian lands in North America by men of European culture. So the next generation, just picking the eyes out of some of these feminist, eco-feminist thinkers, but you see the balance between ecology and women's emancipation and women's critique of patriarchal knowledge systems here. Mary Mellor, she's um, more or less a contemporary of mine, I suppose, in Breaking the Boundaries, 1992. She was uh, very interested in cooperatives, and today we call it commoning, and the gendered replacing uh, neoliberal markets with the gendered division of labour. And she sets up uh, two uh, archetypes, oh, economic archetypes. One she calls the me model, which is competitive and pursued uh, largely by, in the productivist sphere by men, and a relational economic model, which she calls the we model. Uh, and um, she says, if, if we could all uh, move towards this kind of provisioning, um, it, would, it would be liberatory all round for men and women. Because she says, as, as things stand, women are engaged in doing biological labour for men, which frees men up. She said, there's one universal gift that women have given men, it's time. But as a result, women lose control over their own lives. Then uh, I could, the, my own work, which I won't go into, but just to say that it's looking for, for strategies that can join class, ethnic, gender, and species struggles. And we'll come back to it. Uh, in Eastern Europe, Eva Tsiakiewicz is doing very interesting work on ecological economics uh, and, and drawing out the continuities in masculinist uh, conceptualization from classical Greece right up to the Chicago School contemporary economic, uh, liberal economics. And Greta Gard in the United States, she's actually an exponent of literary eco-criticism uh, and her uh, work reviews contemporary American ecofeminism, its move into LGBTQI uh, uh, arena and, and its other new interest in animal studies. Although she finds that US ecofeminism is pulled back by a prevalence for liberal identity politics and rights-based discourse. Uh, and that the linguistic turn, uh, popular in many cultural and gender studies department, has actually made a materialist analysis unfashionable. So she has her hands full uh, trying to keep the ecofeminist focus in the United States. And lastly, to look at Anna Isla, who's a Peruvian sociologist, her book, The Greening of Costa Rica, quite recent, 2015, looks at green capitalist projects endorsed by United Nations and the impacts on community livelihoods in South America. She finds NGOs like the World Wildlife Fund and uh, InBio are pushing kinds of sustainable development policy such as debt for nature swaps or microcredit programs, which end up drawing on women's traditional botanical knowledge and translating it across to the commodified sphere for very low monetary return for the women. Uh, they're hardly compensated for the loss of their knowledge in subsistence production. So these NGOs are sabotaging women's autonomy in this sense and often the women in South American rural areas are being forced back into reliance on patriarchal support. So if you look around the world uh, today, uh, the World March of Women or women in South China villages are reviving traditional farming uh, methods in, in the search of food sovereignty. 
uh, in Australia, women ecofeminists are struggling against um, a, a mad rush for urban renewal and infrastructure development. In Uruguay, we would have the Women in the World Rainforest Movement. In Africa, there's a very savvy group, anti-extractivist, anti-mining group called Wo Min, right across the continent, and they call their work ecofeminist. And they appeared at the climate talks with an ecofeminist manifesto. Uh, in socialism, uh, ecofeminists are engaged in debate. I myself have debated James O'Connor, who was one of the first sociologists with his idea of the second contradiction, that is, Marx described the first contradiction, which was economic. The second contradiction is the contradiction capitalism faces when it's, resor when it's eating away its own resource base, basically. Another uh, interesting eco-Marxist is John Bellamy Foster, who's very prolific at the moment, um, editor of Monthly Review in New York. He has identified what he sees as the metabolic rift um, intrinsic to capitalist uh, productivism uh, and the parasitic um, reliance of cities on rural hinterlands, breaking down the ecosystemic flow of, of regions. So ecofeminists, and I've been quite active in this myself, have joined journals such as Capitalism, Nature, Socialism and set up ecofeminist collectives, editorial collectives, trying to get the men, the Marxist men, to read our work and to engage with the issues that our experience shows us are, are really important. And there are other debates going on. For example, um, the deep ecologists, if you have heard of them, uh, very good, very deep, but not deep enough to understand where feminism fit, fits into the exploitation of nature. Or the social ecologists, or the ecological e economists, and I've just given, where's our book? <laughs> I've just given okay. Katerina a book which you, you can check out, which is uh, the second book we did, which was um, Eco-Sufficiency and Global Justice, which is an eco-feminist critique of um, ecological economics. Yeah, look for the cover. That's Pluto Press, London. Shall I give it to the audience? Do you want to have a look? Shall Do you want to pass it around? Yeah. Yeah. So you get a, a picture, uh, I think, of... Um, oh, and there's been some debate also with, uh, within feminism itself, particularly liberal feminists who want equality in men's terms, identical, uh, are unable to see the depth of ecological feminism the focus on everyday life seems regressive to them, whereas in actual fact, there is no going forward for feminism unless we can sort out the capitalist crisis, the crisis of subsistence, to use Maria Mee's word. Um, it's a much bigger picture. And, and the eco-feminist work is, is it, if, I like to see it as a sociology of knowledge, actually, eco-feminism. Uh, in it when it's theorised, that it's digging right underneath capitalist patriarchal relations and exposing new contradictions which Marxism didn't pick on. So I'm going to talk a little bit now um, and then we should stop and maybe have a hearing. Um, on, I'd just like to run through some critical concepts or, or shall we have a little break before I do that? Would you, what would you prefer? I think we should first uh, um, hear some, Keep some of your Keep theoretical Keep going. Uh, okay. If positions. you'll forgive me, uh, I'll read this part. I, I had about four hours sleep in the last three days and um, travelling from Sydney. So uh, this, is, this is a short um, exploration of some of the critical concepts that I'm working with. So... Humanity nature links are multiple and overdetermined in material and cultural ways. In a theoretical sense, one might say that ecofeminist politics expresses what Bertel Ullmann describes as a dialectic of internal relations. 
Women activists defy the dualist humanity over nature ideology with various ends in view. Some feminists struggling for individual expression free of gender stereotypes are uncomfortable talking about nature altogether. But given the in infinite diversity of ecological relations, transformative politics will embrace the idea of human identity as nature in embodied form. This simply means contesting the ideological code, humanity, nature, man, woman, white, black, and so on, from a new vantage point, as the environmental crisis demands we do. In sociological terms, the level of abstraction in our focus now shifts from relations of production between capital and labour to more universally encompassing relations of reproduction between labour and nature. I repeat that because I think it's an absolutely critical shift in ecofeminism and it's a massive challenge to Marxist thinkers. In sociological terms, the level of abstraction in our focus shifts from relations of production between capital and labour to more universally encompassing relations of reproduction between labour and nature. With these theoretical moves, a common theory and praxis can be developed for socialist, post-colonial, feminist and environmental politics. Careful ecofeminist arguments depart from liberal and socialist anthropocentrism, that is human chauvinism, taking up an ecocentric standpoint. A politics of equality and imminent critique now becomes open to difference and transcendent critique. So we shift from equality and imminent critique to difference and transcendent critique. The history of patriarchal relations extends back many thousands of years, whereas capitalism is only a few hundred years old. These social formations might be seen in nested frames with modern capital protected inside the older patriarchal frame. The unifying thread between the two phases of domination is, as I see it, the libidinal rift that is, a denial of the mother's seemingly powerful subjectivity. This rift primes the growth of masculine identity at an individual level. At a social level, the dissociation is resolved through institutionalised control of women's fertility and caregiving. This ancient sex-gendered contradiction underpinning, underpins all fault lines and therefore not merely socio-historical, but infused with and maintained by embodied energies. The primitive social exchange of reproductive women between men and later the fetishized exchange of man-made commodities for value can now be understood as a sublimation of man-to-man -man recognition. This reading of the principle of equivalence should not undermine the Marxist exposition of capitalist dynamics, but rather highlight just how relations of production similar, similar, simultaneously gratify deeper masculinist needs. In actuality, beneath the libidinal rift that constitutes masculine identity and its armouring dualisms, all humans are nature in embodied form. But the discourse of mastery, man over woman, etc., constructs women's subjectivity as non-identical with itself. This historical version of femininity, which we've all been subjected to as we are socialised, this historical version of femininity floats between two contradictory signifiers, reflecting its origin in the projection of masculine ambivalence towards the body of the mother. That is to say, a woman is neither humanity nor is she nature, but exists somewhere in between. Conversely, this imposed psychological non-identity favours a woman's existential flexibility and her potential for ideology critique. Thus, when a woman is in crisis, say nuclear exposure of her child perhaps, 
she readily gains insights that dissolve her connection with the prevailing social order. The energetic release that comes with this dialectical negation drives ecofeminist political agency. This is what I'm getting towards an embodied materialism. An ecofeminist politics can affirm the efforts of socialist feminists to situate women's domestic labour in Marxist problematic. It can accept the proposition that women's unpaid services yield use values and may even contribute to the generation of surplus value for capital. As many women did argue, particularly Mar uh, Ro Maria Rosa Dalla Costa and Selma James in the 1980s, the wages for housework. Beyond this, an embodied materialism will turn to the vital but unspoken margin where the labour mediation of nature is carried out. This begs a value form quite distinct from use and exchange, a form that expresses the regenerative capacity of human and extra-human natures. In the enhancement and protection of this metabolic value, relations of reproduction take precedence over relations of production. So for example, in the global north, family caregivers are typically attuned to holding bodily cycles in place, similar to Mary Mello's notion of women putting in biological time in the household. Indigenous Australians, for another example, hold systems together through their circular gathering economies, described as having a good fit with country. Via Campesina work, workers, peasants, affirm that their labours are designed to dovetail human and environmental well-being. In fact, Via Campesina recently at the Paris COP uh, negotiations, or maybe it's a little bit before, were arguing our way of life cools down the earth. As opposed to mining and smelting or genetic engineering, which leave disorder and waste, women's and subaltern labours give life back to the biosphere. And this silently subsidises capitalism. But the entrepreneurial pursuit of exchange value as such results in thermodynamic entropy, reducing material bodies as much as it degrades nature at large. Thus, as Marx noted, a social debt is owed to workers for extraction of their surplus labour time in factory production. What Marx did not observe was that an embodied debt is owed to mothers for reproduction of the next generation of labour and consumer power. A post-colonial debt is owed to peoples of the global south whose livelihood resources are appropriated in primitive accumulation. An intergenerational debt is owed to youth who will inherit an overheated planet. And finally, an ecological debt is owed to the full web of biodiversity's species sacrificed to the fetish of exchange. When Marxists write that face-to-face -face communication is historically obsolete, they reiterate the enli Enlightenment mythology of the machine. The point is that humanity only survives thanks to human reproductive relations with nature. David Harvey, back in 93, calls up the masculinist technovision when he writes that, for Marxists, there can be no going back, as many ecologists seem to propose, to an unmediated relation of nature with nature, to a pre-capitalist and communitarian world of non-scientific understandings with limited divisions of labour. What this elitist and evolutionist claim overlooks is the fact that the human relation to nature has never been unmediated and it continues to be mediated by women, peasants, and others at the domestic and geographic peripheries of capital. A similar bias and alienation from necessary labour appears when Jeremy Rifkin celebrates the fact that humanity has created an artificial time environment punctuated by mechanical contrivances and electronic impulses, a time plane that is quantitative, fast-paced, efficient, and predictable. 
humans interacting with machines are readily seduced by the laws of motion. But even in the 21st century, class, race and gender attitudes to the technological imperative vary widely. If Eurocentric modernizers only know their environments through a distorting instrumental rational lens, meta-industrial workers, the reproductive workers I've just mentioned, learn other principles by hands-on immersion in the material world. Theirs is a vernacular science learning to replicate the thermodynamic synergies that keep organisms charged. An embodied kinesthetic epistemology seems necessary to counter, encounter these enfolded internal relations of humans with nature. The slower timescales of living processes, for example, only come to be understood through care, caregiving labour, and this gives rise to a precautionary ethic which is the essence of ecological action. Whereas the industrial manufacture of commodities breaks biotic flows apart, meta-industrial reason meets human needs in a way that preserves metabolic value and ecosystem renewal. In an era of ecological crisis, this global majority of workers, I dare call it a meta-industrial class, acts as a direct agent of material change and increasingly, and really direct, I mean, it is, the change is actually embodied in the labour that they're doing, political work. As a direct agent of material change, and increasingly, they are a leading voice in meetings of the ultra-globalisation movement. Wherever such models of provisioning exist today, protecting them should be uh, an international priority. Ecofeminists envisage a new kind of capacity building to ground the UN and World Bank, G20 and other masters of the affluent North. As noted, this elite politics rests on false universals, economy over ecology, mind over body, North over South. But the challenge is real. Transnational corporations, governments, NGOs and the universities are all invested in the global system as it stands. Yes, the universities are invested in the global system as it stands. UN agency jargon like sustainable development or mainstreaming are simply euphemisms for turning women and indigenous peoples into white middle class consumers. There is also ecofeminist work to do on the left, helping social movements with a shared language for workers, women's, indigenous and ecological politics. While Marxism offers an essential sociological analysis of capitalism, its emphasis on relations of production diminishes reproductive labour. In Ecofeminism as Politics, the book, I've argued that embodied materialist ecofeminism can converge with Marxist theory of internal relations in at least seven ways. These are an ontology of nature as multidimensional and dynamic, a notion of human identity as embedded in and affirmed through interaction with nature, a dialectical epistemology, an understanding that sensuous praxis is basic to valid knowledge, a recognition of labour as driving the history of class struggle, but now we're talking reproductive labour, regenerative labour, a view of first and second or social nature as mutually determining a theory of the commodity fetish ideology and alienation. Indeed, the young Marx described the ideal communist society as the consummate oneness, this is quoting, the consummate oneness in substance of man and nature, the true resurrection of nature, the naturalization of man and the humanism of nature both brought to fulfillment. In reconciling Marxism and ecofeminism, it's important to acknowledge that a libidinal politics politics of bodily energies is not ahistorical, since biological bodies are always already conditioned by social forces. And embodied materialism is a reminder that the materiality of nature, of human bodies and societies, is always in process, not static, given or essentialized. 
Beyond this, critical thought needs to be materially grounded in passion and action to be relevant, reflexive and open-ended. Embodiment joins theory and praxis, making politics historically sensitive and accountable. So I'll stop at that and see where we go. Okay. The last part was kind of dense, oh. very com yeah, bringing together very uh, many thoughts uh, from a long time of your working in this field. There may be questions, please ask. Don't hesitate to ask simple questions, complicated questions, whatever you like, and try to relate to what Ariel presented. Is there any comment or question? You're asking me, are the trade unions still relevant? It's true that there have been some shortcomings in understanding, being insensitive to ecological problems and feminist problems, but on the other hand, it's not total. And what positive role can there be for trade unions going forward into the future, um, working particularly with the other movements? And it's a marvellous question. And But before I answer, can I just indulge in a little story from Australia. In 1970s, there was a big fight going on in Sydney led by the Builders Workers Industrial Union and a man called Jack Mundy. And Jack Mundy formed the, build, the BWIU as a green trade union. And what they did was they put green bands on building sites around the city because there was hyper-development, as usual. Uh, anything which had heritage, va heritage value, anything which might have environmental consequences were not good, or buildings were not good for people's health, they, they covered the spectrum. Uh, and literally, massive development sites were brought to a halt because the builders' labourers would not allow the work to proceed. So they were forcing the politicians and the developers to rethink how they were proceeding. Now, the University of Sydney, this was also the time, the 70s, of the emergence of this first wave or second wave of feminism, uh, wanting development to, to, uh, to go on the campus. And uh, at the same time, the women at the University of Sydney in the philosophy department were wanting to start a women's studies department, a gender studies department. So the Vice-Chancellor called the trade union, the Green, Jack Mundy, in and said, please, uh, you know, we, 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 we want you guys to cooperate. We need uh, buildings and so forth. And the, the Green Band leaders said, we will put a total ban on development of your campus until you give these women a women's studies department. And they did, and they did. So that's how a magnificent story of unionists being both green and feminist supporters. And Petra Kelly, who you, some of you would be old enough to remember, uh, the late Petra Kelly, who was a wonderful founder of German Greens, came out to Sydney at that time and met Jack Mundy and said she wanted to come back to, 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 to Germany and get this idea going of, of green trade unions. Uh, it didn't happen, but the Green Party happened here. Uh, but uh, there is a book, if you want to have a look, two of the feminist women who went through the Women's Studies Department became professors, their sisters as it happened, and they have written a book, Bergman and Bergman, uh, and it's called The Green Bands, and uh, it's available in Germany because I found a copy in the library in Jena. <laughs> so it, it's Check it out. Now, to come back to your question, uh, there at, right now, uh, there are different... There are... First of all, we are on an historical moving process, all of us. And what the trade unions were when I was young, maybe even you young, younger, uh, are, are not necessarily what they are today. The, Capitalism is not what it was then. Uh, 
And now we're in this period of decolonization, which is occurring, I mean, you can even see some of the terrorist episodes under that heading, but we're in a period of decolonization. The global south is coming forward in various ways and demanding justice for centuries of imperial plunder. Now, we, that is probably the strongest um, political urgency that's happening in the world today. And feminism needs to find a way to work with that because that is what is going to, it is already tackling capitalism. Uh, and also in, there are very important ecological knowledges that are coming out of the global south, as I've just said, indigenous peasants, different modes of reproductive labor, which are dovetailing with radical m efforts by young people in the global north to develop livelihood economies, commoning alternatives. And we have, of course, in the global south, Buen Vivir, um, Ubuntu in Africa, these models of simple livelihood, different kinds of economies. In those economies, unions won't even be necessary because unions are, if you like, the, evolved as the mirror image of capitalism. So as we dual power capitalism and move to alternatives, unionists will need to decide, do they want to go with that and contribute to that? Or do they want to stay playing football with capitalism? <laughs> yeah. In, in an, another Australian model, union model, and we've always been very strong in trade unions there and very strong arbitration laws until just recently, until the last onslaught of neoliberalism in the last 15 years, um, is a women-led movement. It used to be called the Miscellaneous Workers' Women, uh, Workers' Union, but it's fully run by women uh, not only for women, but it deals with, I guess it deals with the precarious, preca pre precariat, yeah. And they have, they are very innovative and very supportive of feminist struggles and ecological struggles and alternatives. So unions can transmorph into uh, broader, more broadly conceptualised, a, a broader identity, a broader notion of union identity. And very important, because capitalism fragments us. It fragments everyday life. It fragments our relationships. You get on the, the train and everybody's, you know, reading their little thing, not talking to people around them and so on. It's, it's quite, psychologically, it's quite disastrous what is happening at the moment. So any kind of groupings that are coming together to make small changes, so invaluable. Does that meet what you need? Okay, in the middle. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I, I come from Chile, South America, and I came to Berlin to study public policy. And one of my best friends also from Chile is doing a PhD uh, specialized in microfinances. So I would very much like to hear more about these contradictions that microfinances have uh, uh, with the concept of ecofeminism, if you would like to do that for ah, me, please. Y yes. Um, largely, um, well, I did touch on that when I mentioned um, Anna Isler's work, the Peruvian sociologist. When I, she has exposed the fragility and the, the uh, of microfinance as a project um, in terms of destabilizing women's existing um, resources and power relations. And in Bangladesh, there have been very good ecofeminist. Um, exposés of microfinancing as well. Um, look, how far do you want to go? I mean, another book we did not so long ago was called Life Without Money. Um, check it out. I think it was 
Pluto Press. The most, I'm in the moment, I'm editing a post-development dictionary and we are taking in, we have about 80 contributors from around the world who are writing short extracts on visionary projects for the future that they have begun or are, are working with. And most of them, particularly those coming from the Global South, but the Global North as well, I mean, you, Barcelona is a hive of degrowth and turning towards livelihoods and commoning and self-sufficiency without money. Mutuality. So the, this movement is enormous around the world. It's a matter of plugging into it. Um, the other side of this is more of the same. Um, if we, there's, there's a part of my work that deals with um, examining the Rio Earth Summits and the contradictions embedded in United Nations policy when the corporate sector has basically invaded the UN and is manipulating the different departments of the UN and the World Bank and the World Trade Organization. Um, even the sustainable development goals, I can send you something if you like to read on that, are actually, I just had an email from Wolfgang Sachs who, who has written a paper for our dictionary because the dictionary is actually a celebration of his magnificent contribution to green political thought in, in Germany and around the world. And he actually said, um, now I've lost my track, one moment. He actually said, uh, are the sustainable development goals are a testament to the failure of sustainable, sustainable development, of the development project at all. Yeah. And I could give you detailed breakdown on that. Particularly, my particular interest is in water, because they talk about peak oil. Man, you see nothing till we get to peak water. And that's intrinsically embodied in the climate change crisis. Uh, you know, these things are all connected. So I'm, I might sound like I'm rabbiting on or rambling a bit here, but <laughs> I'm trying to say that we, policy for whom, policy by whom, for whom and for what purpose. And the, increasingly the universities are being run as agencies for the corporate sector. And the state was captured long ago by capital. And... I trained as a sociologist. I thought I could be a sociologist, that I could make good policy and help fix problems up. How naive was I? <laughs> you, we really have to examine uh, the nature of capitalism, the nature of knowledge making in capitalism and how it is eating up all our institutions or all our finest endeavours. There's another one uh, which, which uh, I've been researching in the last few years called Earth System Governance, which is coming out of the Netherlands, which is an ambitious um, policy to almost provide environmental governance for the world through the United Nations, but using a neoliberal paradigm. So that would consolidate. Uh, the here and now and what we already have. And if you're doing research, it's really good to get into these things and de-gut them and, and open them out and just see what are the hidden consequences. Um, yeah. Was this an answer? Because you asked um, about the question of microfinance especially. Yes, she got it. Yeah, okay, great. Any further? No, it's a no-no. <laughs> Yeah. Hello. You mentioned about the identity-based feminist movements in different uh, parts of the world. I'm trying to figure out what exactly your uh, view on the boundaries of these identities or the values which are put forth by these identities in relation with the larger 
uh, feminist ideas. I am asking this specifically because um, uh, someone like, say, Vandana Shiva, uh, on the one hand, very clearly um, uh, professing the indigenous values uh, of and uh, the progressive values, but at the same time, quite quite profoundly flirting with the right wing, extreme right wing politics, say in India. So, how how do you how do you exactly set these boundaries? Yes, I ha I have. I mean, detractors of Vandana Shiva's work often accuse her of flirting with the right wing. Um, I think I think she is. I mean, there's a fine line between that and between honouring traditional Indian Hindu culture. You know, there, there's. I, I realise that Modi, for example, is is using your current prime minister is using. Uh, Hinduism as a form of national social national uh, nationalization thing and, and he's using it in a very political way but I, I think Shiva's work doesn't come from that space Shiva's work comes from a much earlier uh, but uh, I, I'd like to go back to your point about identity I didn't quite understand what you were saying but I'll have a guess. Uh, I'll answer it anyway in terms of if you had been asking the question I would like to hear about identity. How about that? So you would have heard, uh, there are many levels of usages of the word identity in when we're talking about politics. Identity politics at the moment, under, under liberalism, identity politics explodes. Liberalism loves dividing blacks versus women versus, you know, ecologists, for, you know. Uh, it's a divide and rule tactic and liberal pluralism and it, it's been very successful in the United States. You know, everybody's being politically correct about their particular identity and it gets to be, it doesn't go anywhere. Which is why it's so important to try to find a common denominator for all the movements, so that we can all move forward together. Because the way things are going, this planet's not going to be here by the end of the century. It really is burning up. So that's one level of identity politics. Now, in philosophy, there's a notion of identity theory. So uh, ba basic logic, and the logic of Ar that came through from the Greeks was that a equals A and cannot equal not A. So a cat is a cat and nothing else, you know, it's A equals A. Um, in the dialectical tradition, uh, the dialectical tradition prefers the logic of non-identity. That is to say, what might have been a cat yesterday is mincemeat today, or it's a terrible, terrible metaphor, but... Uh, <laughs> Forgive me, especially the animal liberationists in the room. But, um, but um, what, what it's saying is that identities are fluid and all material processes on earth are transforming it from one into another, into another. Now, when people have critiqued, some of the early critiques of... Um, of um, ecofeminism, uh, from particularly from liberal um, uh, identified thinkers, uh, assumed the status quo that ecofeminist women were speaking out from their constructed social identity as women. Right now, that's not actually the case. If you really read what ecofeminists have been saying all along, they are actually making an argument about the labour they do and the knowledges they glean from the labour they do. But particularly in the United States, I mean, most, you know, most feminist academics in the US wouldn't know a materialist argument if they tripped over it. So you've got work to do. <laughs> we have work to do. So, um, 
what is an identity or at one particular time will have transformed into something else at another. So it's a continual process of transformation, paradox, contradiction. It's, it's very strong in this book, this ecofeminism as politics. In many ways, it brings the argument into play. And of course, when we wrapped up with some of the key aspects of Marx's dialectical approach, and the ones, and there were seven of them, which are compatible with an ecofeminist analysis um, that hangs in that uh, notion of the logic of non-identity. Yeah. <laughs> More questions or comments? Yes, over here. I'm just thinking a little bit about your comment that um, there is presently enough material on eco-criticism to form the teaching material of an honours um, degree in a university. I mean, are there courses on eco-criticism that exist presently that you think um, are relevant and up-to-date enough? Or is there an implicit critique there about courses being intrinsically out of date the minute that they are conceived or just not being able to keep up with the pace of... Well, good academics events. revise their courses every year. So, <laughs> but um, uh, yes, if we can... Uh, I mean, I did say the universities are being captured by the status quo um, and this whole emphasis on STEM subjects. Um, you know, I don't, do you have that here? Is that big argument? Science, technology and engineering and economics, yeah. Um, only if, you know, the, the only subjects which, which are going to be encouraged are those which can eventually be used in the generation of profits somewhere. And so the humanities are being shrinking, social sciences are shrinking, feminism is shrinking. But if you can get in there and you can have a foothold and you can talk with young people, by all means do it. So. There's plenty of good eco-feminist feminist courses being taught. I actually taught I, possibly the first one in the world in 1983 in the University of New South Wales, university one, um, and I've taught it subsequently in a school of social ecology. I discovered Greta Gard, who I mentioned as an eco, uh, an exponent of eco-criticism, which is the literary Ecofeminism through literary studies has got a brilliant um, course he did. She offers her students in Wisconsin um, at the moment on ecofeminism, but all through novels and poetry and and the rest of it. Um, now, what was the question? <laughs> Is that, have, yeah, got... yeah. No, I have myself sort of come across um, eco criticism courses. I Dumfries, for example, the University of Edinburgh, that seem quite attractive personally. I, I guess I was just wondering about your opinion on the capacity of uni like universities at the moment, um, like the institutional capacity to target the type of issues that you think are so pressing at the moment? Or is it kind of best tackled through um, activism and outside of the structure of... Every, tackle it everywhere. <laughs> Um, it's true there is a lot of censorship going on. My daughter actually works in the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. She's a science editor. And they are being subjected. This is the national broadcaster, which is like the BBC. It's absolutely excellent research material. But they are being uh, threatened and by a conservative government we have in Australia. It's called liberal, but it means conservative. Um, <laughs> And, um, and the universities too, our censorship is occurring and um, you just have to keep doggedly fighting, I mean, to get this stuff heard. Um, people are also setting up alternative uni universities and book discussion groups and things. Um, but, um, yeah. <laughs> Are there other comments or questions? Yes, very in the back. 
Where's the mic? <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> can, I can I just say a, a little bit more to the thing? Uh, this last year, Routledge Publishers, which was big, you know, rather stodgy academic publisher in Britain, um, has bought out in the last one year or two three massive anthologies, eco-feminist eco anthologies. I mean, the, the, it is an explosion of interest in eco-feminism and Routledge are riding on it. However, the interesting thing about these British anthologies, in the traditional British way of not being too committal, here, they're all more or less got the title eco-feminist perspectives or perspectives on. So they're kind of offering a smorgasbord of women's writing in eco-feminism without actually... Um, you know, it's like a supermarket of ideas, um, but not, uh, but not, um, uh, a ha you know, a hard-hitting theoretical uh, publication. Another interesting thing, um, just in the the early onslaught on eco-feminist writing because of people's paranoia about the idea of nature and how you talk about it and so on. Um, went on for about 20 years. I've got scars all over my body from that. Psychological scars. Um, but recently I met a young French philosopher um, in Paris who put together a book called Reclaim. And she was absolutely shocked at what she saw as the violence of women on, on women during that period of debate um, or dogfights on over ecofeminism. And so she's put together, she's, she's urging that that material be revisited. So it's just the right time to do it as well. But she really has a mission for that. Um, just want to think what else. I know there was another question coming. We have a question, yeah. I know, I, I was just thinking. Um, I was saying, so earlier, when the, the, identity, question. the identity question came about, uh, I personally felt like um, the answer meant foc you had to make, like, focus more attention on the environmental environmentalism. And when you spoke about identities and about liberalism, about identity always changing, I feel like when you were saying about the, like, it felt for me that you were saying we should focus more on environmentalism than all the other oppressions. Like, whereas, like, can we not just do that inclusively? I do. You, no, uh, no, stay there. Okay. We, we might, we might. <laughs> <laughs> I do think, you, you're right. I, I do, mm, look. It's like a mother with children, my movements, you know, when you can't prefer one over another. But, but look, in the final analysis, I think I do believe that the environmental question is the ultimate ground of all other politics that we do. Because if we, we are nature, we are embodied, nature in embodied form, if we can't sort that out, there's not going to be any other politics to do. Feminism, workerism, indigenous struggles. Because there won't be people walking around, you know? I mean, it, it, it is. On the other hand, having said that, I do think the origin of the environmental crisis is gendered. It is sex gendered. So from an historical point of view, it has evolved. <clears throat> through masculinist institutions and practices and choices into the present mess that we have. And so we can't actually do environmental struggle without understanding that if we don't fix that part of it out there, the whole thing is going to come right back again, you know. So, I guess that's what makes me an ecological feminist. <laughs> um, as for the 
other two movements, the workers' movement and indigenous struggles, post-decolonial, post-colonial struggle. Well, you could say the, the struggle with capitalism is actually a struggle with patriarchal, because capitalism is the latest version of patriarchal civilization. So if we're deal so we can kind of deal with that if we are probably dealing with the way masculinist values are satisfied and embodied and promoted and so forth through capitalism. So you could I suppose you could call me a feminist reductionist. Don't say I said that. I didn't say that. I do a Donald Trump. <laughs> um, the indigenous one is Well, it's embedded in the ecological struggle. It's also embedded in the struggle for cap the capital against capitalism as well. Um, I don't know that they're, they're all interlocking, and yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's why I was like saying that we should maybe just we can uh, be inclusive in our activism and our academic work and everything like that. We can, you know, fight for environmental rights and environmentalism as well as. Uh, oh yeah. You have to. Yeah, exactly. You have to. You have to go forward with the whole four yeah. at the same time. It, it, because they, they all sustain each other. And, and it's much easier to see, that, see this out in the world of praxis when you go to the World Social Forum, which is fading out a bit now, or the big Rio revivals when you get the alternative globalization movement there or the the big there's a lovely website called systemic alternatives which is mainly coming out of south america um, which is mainly driven by the decolonial impulse but it's it's dealing with these others at the same time so um if you can get your sleeves rolled up and get out there in these struggles, it gets much clearer, clearer than anything you'll be taught in schools. Yeah. 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 Okay, maybe we are coming to, to an end. We will have a G20 event here in the beginning of July in Hamburg, as you know. That's probably one side to struggle. Everybody. <laughs> And uh, the question stays, what can be the common denominator? You said a lot about this during your talk today, but still this question is in the room, why there are so many uh, attempts to bring about new movements and new uh, forms of collectivity, of collective action on the streets, on the places, wherever, and why is it yet not so easy to bring about a huge movement then? So this stays with us. And I would say thank you to you. You can stay and talk with us and Ariel if you like, uh, uh, individually. And a warm thanks to you and coming and sharing your thoughts and story. Thank you.